Glad to be here tonight. Amen and amen. Well, I know we started our fasting schedule, and I don't know if I made some people mad, but where are they? What happened? Ah, uh, they said, forget this. They, they, they want to go to a church where uh, they're always feasting on <laughs> calling corral or something. Amen. Uh, I know people get off of work kind of late and have to tend to the kids and all that, so no problem, no problem. We'll be here for them. You may have your seats. Let me go ahead and get started. Uh, let me cover a few things before uh, we get into some word and and uh, get into prayer. Sunday, I announced that we were, uh, you know, how we were engaging uh, January, the the first month of, of the year in our culture, how we were in, uh, how we were applying spiritual principles, uh, spiritual acts in order to have a great influence on January, which is considered, again, our culture, the uh, first month of the year. So as far as we're concerned, here in America, January is the first. So what we're trying to do is really shape and really impact January. We're not concerned about February, March, all the way to December. We're mainly concerned about January. Can anybody tell me why only that month? Because the condition of the first sets the condition of the rest. Right? Remember what we're learning. Satan did, did not attack the entire human race. He just went after Adam. If he could get to Adam, everything else will fall the same. Same thing. God didn't have to bless the whole world. He just had to bless the Lord Jesus Christ. And then anyone that is uh, attached to him or identified with him receives the same. So we're, we're taking all kinds of steps to really impact uh, the month of January. So I highly, highly, highly encourage that you uh, are engaged in what we're doing for this month. Four things that we're engaging. We're engaging communion. We learned about conversations at the table. The, the conversations at the communion table are different than any other conversation. Why? Because in the middle of that conversation is the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ and a cup of His blood. So that is a covenant uh, meeting that is be being taking place. And that's why you can uh, discuss covenant uh, at that table. Number two that we are engaging, we're engaging a schedule of prayer and we're learning we're going to be looking at this concept of prayer, this spiritual act from, from different points of view so, uh, in order to really inspire and uh, build up your faith. The third thing we're going to be engaging in the month of January is a schedule of fasting. Now, I already gave us uh, uh, a, a, a schedule of that. I said that those of you that are going to participate, that we will all do it together in one mind and one accord because that just generates even greater power. So the schedule we're fo following is that we're taking a, a tremendous sacrifice. It's especially, uh, you know, big for others, and for others it's not uh, that big. But we are engaging in an hour of prayer, an hour of prayer a day. I know that might be a lot for some people that are very, very busy, and you got all, all kinds of things going on in your life. But think about it. Think about what you're saying. If you can't find that hour, you're saying to the Lord, I've got 24 hours and I can't find one for you. Out of 24, I can't find one hour for you. In other words, you're that far back at the bus that everything else comes before you. And I've been living like that and I can't, now I can't seem to find an hour for you. Now, when we're engaging in this hour of prayer, I know, and Praying for an hour can be uh, a thing of endurance for some people. Uh, so I'm going to try and give you some, some pointers uh, here in a few minutes. Also, uh, I'm going to help you to hopefully really make that hour as powerful as, as possible. So this is some of the things that you can try. If you can't, for some reason, one of those days you can't find an hour, then split it in 30 minutes apiece. I wouldn't recommend that you split it any smaller than that. Because remember, 
you're attempting to climb the mountain of Moses. Okay? If you start doing, you know, five minutes here, well, I'll just pray a minute, you know, every hour for the rest of the day. No, no. You, you, you want to stay in the presence of God. I recommend that you do an hour, but if you absolutely can't for that particular day, do 30 minutes in the morning, do 30 minutes at night. During your hour of prayer, as much as you can, that would be a great time for you to be in the fasting mode. So what I'm asking you uh, as, as far as the schedule is for everybody to fast at least one meal a day. One meal a day. And the reason I ask you to, to see if you can put them together because you're going to be more in tune to the Spirit of God during your time of fasting and then during your time of prayer that's where there can be a lot of exchange going on between you and the Holy Spirit because you're in the middle of prayer as opposed to fasting but you're you know working behind a computer at, at your job you know you're not really paying attention for anything you're in a fasting mode but you're really not paying attention sometimes you may not be able to help that because maybe you're fasting your lunch hour but if you can, I would recommend that you alter your schedule to see if you can uh, pray uh, and fast at the same time. Again, for some of you that an hour seems a long time, uh, this is uh, something else that you can try. This is something that I do quite often. And for example, if I'm in my, in my study and I'm on my knees uh, in prayer, what I do is I have the Bible open also. And many times I'll have uh, my phone where I use a, a note app where I take notes. Why? Because I'm expecting to hear something from God. So when God sees my notebook open, He knows that I'm ready to hear something, some kind of instruction. See? So by faith, I've got my, my notebook open so that when He speaks to me, I can jot it down, type it in, whatever, I'm, whatever the case may be. And what I do is I have my Bible open. And usually I have it open to start off with in Psalm 119. I encourage you to use Psalm 119 unless you got another portion of Scripture that you prefer. But I think Psalm 119 is a very good psalm uh, to be dealing with during this time of prayer and fasting in the month of January. We're trying to accomplish a couple things. One, we're trying to influence the rest of the year and we're trying to impact you we're trying to put you in a in a best spiritual condition during this month so you can proceed to the rest of the year uh, at, from from a different growth level if I can say it like that so here's what I recommend again an hour of prayer every day try to do your fasting during that hour if you can and then also uh, engage Psalm 119. This is why I like Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a Psalm of David. It's about 176 verses, I believe, if I remember correctly. 176 verses, so it's quite long, and it's enough for an hour. 176 verses. Why? Because Psalm 119 is a Psalm where David kept describing the challenges that he was going through. And the spiritual responses that he was making. He would say, look, this is happening, but this is how I'm responding. So you'll get just a, a chance to see and, be, and actually be reading out loud that psalm. So I'll get on my knees. I'll have my Bible open, say, for example, to Psalm 119. And this is what I'll do. I'll pray for about five minutes read a few of those verses from Psalm 119 for about five minutes. Read it nice and slow because you're eating. And then I pray another five minutes and then I, I read the next few verses of Psalm 119. Pray for another five minutes and then I go back to the verses. What am I doing? I'm trying to get the Word to come alive for me. I want the Word to be uh, transformed from ink on paper to the voice of the Lord. So I go back and forth. I read a few, a few verses. I go back into prayer. And in prayer, I may discuss with God what I just read. Discuss the Word of God with Him. Discuss it with Him. 
talk to him about what you're not understanding or talk to him about what you're noticing in the scripture i guarantee you if you do this method of study and prayer and worship the scriptures will come alive and they will begin to speak to you letters will become a voice so i do that the whole time i pray a little bit get back in the word pray a little bit i get back in the word pray a little bit get back in the word don't be in such a rush to read the scriptures one word from one line can speak volumes just one word out of that whole sentence one word can speak volumes what's going to happen if you're doing this and this is why you want your notebook when you're reading your verses there's going to be some maybe even just one that's really going to speak to you write it down or mark it or highlight it now you really want to zero in because now the Holy Spirit is beginning to open that scripture up for you. Like an acorn that's housing an oak tree, it's beginning to crack open. So that is how I, uh, how I do my prayer sessions uh, many times is a little bit of word, prayer, word, prayer, word, prayer, word, prayer. It gives me something to discuss with the Lord. How many of y'all have ever gotten into prayer and you run out of things to say? Or your mind is drifting off. You're in prayer. says, man, I'm going to try and pray for an hour today. Ten minutes into that, you're already thinking about church's fried chicken. You know, or you're thinking about, you know, the kids need to be fed. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I forgot to pay this bill. And you're already, you're already thinking about stuff like that. And then you say, oh, oh, Lord, I'm supposed to be praying. Forgive me, Lord. And, and you got this battle going on where your mind is drifting. And then at times you find yourself like you woke up. Like, oh, my God. How long was I asleep? You go through all those things because your flesh is kind of giving you a hard time because you're trying to enter into a spiritual realm. You're trying into a spiritual realm and you're being, so to speak, pulled back so that you don't enter into that. So again, the word, these letters need to become a voice. You need to enter into a presence. This is how you can tell when you have move into another realm from an earthly realm to a spiritual realm what's going to happen is your flesh is no longer the loudest voice in other words you know your, your flesh will talk to you your flesh will say like boy i'm really getting hungry like, how long have i been doing this oh don't forget to do this well i gotta pay the bill oh, you know, lord forgive me when, when you're done struggling you've entered another realm now now the physical dimension is losing its hold on You'll notice that the physical dimension will begin to lose its hold. You'll know that you entered another dimension above that one when you're lost in His presence. You've entered another dimension. Now once you enter those higher dimensions, that's where you begin to run into His voice. When you enter another dimension, that's where you begin to come into His power. And the more you go up these dimensions, now you're hearing prophetic things. The longer you stay there, the more you're moving into dimensions. Now, somebody will say, well, Pastor, how long does it take for me to get there? It depends on how much, of, how much carnality you have. Okay? If you just watched two, three hours of TV and social media... I believe it will take you days. But I believe that if you're doing this, it may take you a little while the first day. The second day is going to take less time. By the fourth and fifth day, it's, taking, it's, it's going by really quick. By the end of the week, you are already moving into different dimensional realms. Now you're beginning to, more scriptures are speaking to you. The presence of God is stronger. You might receive your healing right there and then. You'll, you'll hear a word of wisdom. When those things begin to happen, it's because you already moved into different dimensions. Well, imagine if you stick with this for 30 days. Where you will be by the end of January, it'll be a different person walking into February. Simply because you're just going through these spiritual exercises of crucifying the flesh in order so your spirit, man, can come alive. 
I'm, what I mean by alive, I'm not talking about being born again because that happens because of the cross. But I'm, uh, what I'm talking about is your ears and your eyes begin to open. They begin to open as you become accustomed of going up into these dimensions. That's what the mountain of Moses represented. Different elevations, meaning different dimensions that a person goes into the longer he stays. Moses received the Ten Commandments that would guide humanity. How long was he up there? 40 days. 40 days fast. That's what it cost him. 40 days. So God will not allow you to come into certain dimensions without you paying for it. Without you paying. Because carnal people are not allowed in, in, in those dimensions. Mediocre, warm uh, Christians, they're not allowed in certain dimensions. There are certain dimensions that you, you, won't, you won't be allowed un, uh, to get into unless you pay a great price. That's why when you hear some of these men of God and how they move in some of these spiritual dimensions, go back and listen to their, and, and watch their lifestyle. Watch their lifestyle and watch the price that they pay. They had to pay that to enter into certain dimensions. You can't move in a prophetic without paying a price. You won't hear the voice of God without paying a certain price. Because every step of glory starts off with a sacrifice at the altar. You cannot enter a level of glory without first laying something down as a sacrifice on an altar. You have to lay your flesh on that altar. You have to lay down time. You have to lay down the distractions of the world. You got to step away from the things of the world if you want to move higher and higher in these dimensions. So again, our schedule for January, and I'm, I'm, this is not the message for today, but I'm just going over with you our schedule for this month. One hour prayer. If, if you have to break it down, rather you not do that. But if you have to, do 30 minutes in the morning, do 30 minutes at night. You know, if, if the day gets away from you, try and do your fasting during that hour of prayer. Open up Psalm 119. You're going to see that Psalm 119 is going to be focused not only on what David went through and his responses, but he's going to highlight the Word of God. When you see the word precepts, commandments, uh ordinances, uh, statutes. He's talking about the word. He'll say, this, this, this has happened to me, but your commandments. This and this, and this but your word. And this and this happened to me and my enemies surrounded me, but your, your statutes. He, he's, he's always referring back to what he did with the word. Always. So he'll explain, look, this is what I went through. I was surrounded. My enemies almost trampled me. Oh, he's going through all of that. He says, but your word. But your statutes, your precepts, your commandments. He's giving focus to the Word. That's why I, I'm encouraging you to do Psalm 119, if you can, uh, during this month that we're in the middle of. When we finish this month again, we're going to uh, uh, conclude the month with uh, communion. We're going to be speaking about the cup of the Lord we're going to be speaking about the cup of demons and how people are partaking of one of those two cups. So we'll be speaking on that uh, at, at the end of the month. So again, four things we're engaging. Communion, prayer, fasting, and first fruits. First fruits. What I invited the congregation to do is the individual families, husbands, wives, children, whatever the case may be, come together at the dinner table, put together your first fruit offering. We, we, this past service, we taught quite extensively, the service before, on that. To bring something out of a cursed and a cursed state, God uses the law of first fruit to redeem it. Anything, that, now what is a curse? We, we talked about this last service. Is a state of struggle. God describes it in Genesis. Where he told Adam, you're going to live by the sweat of your brow. In other words, the curse is a life of struggle. 
your money's not making it for some reason it may not be blessed my life is just full of struggle I don't know what you've done with it but it might need to go through a redeeming process besides what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross sometimes even after we become Christians we get involved in certain things that now we've left openings in our lives that we're involved in certain things we shouldn't be let me tell you the law of first fruits always has redeeming power so learn uh, how to do that so four things uh, law of first fruits we're engaging communion prayer and fasting so this whole month I'm going to be teaching on those concepts uh, and this Sunday if uh, unless the Lord kind of guides me in a different direction we're going to be looking at, uh, at prayer I believe from a perspective you, you probably have never heard probably have never heard because I've never taught it in all these 30 years but this this coming service we're going to be getting into that amen does it sound good sound like a good plan amen amen we're trying to condition you spiritually for this coming year because a lot of bad things are happening around the world and you cannot walk in that with yesterday's anointing with yesterday's knowledge you got to walk into this a new situations better equipped and that's what we're uh, working and trying to do with you okay if you got your Bibles let's turn them real quick over to uh, Exodus 19 we've been camping out at at the base of Mount Sinai Exodus chapter 19 we've been looking at that that scripture over and over again let me uh, kind of share something with you concerning the Word of God before I get into some one uh, Exodus 19 because sometimes I hear an individual, well, pastor already, already preached from that, from that scripture. Or why is a pastor hit that scripture again? A couple reasons. And you'll see that that's my style, is that I'll take a scripture, I'll take a portion of scripture from the Bible. Because a, a diamond, when you look at a diamond that's being cut up, as you turn it in the light, it gives you a different color. When you take one scripture, you'll see something in it, turn it, and you'll see something else. Turn it, you'll see something else. Turn it, and you'll see something else. You'll never exhaust this living word. I don't care if you, if you, if you read the same scripture every day for an entire year, you'll never run out of new discoveries. Just one scripture every day for the rest of the year, you'll never run out. Because remember, the word of God is a seed. And like an acorn, it's hiding an oak tree. So once you crack that scripture open, it'll show you the oak tree. And you celebrate because, wow, look at this massive, beautiful, massive oak tree. But then if you look closely, that oak tree has thousands of seeds. So now you got to crack open all those seeds and expose all those oak trees. And you're celebrating because now not only are you seeing one oak tree, but you've sown thousands of acorns and now you have thousands of trees and you're celebrating because you discovered, you made a new discovery. You didn't know that one seed was housing one tree that was housing hundreds or thousands of seeds that were housing houses, uh, hundreds or thousands of trees and you're celebrating and you say, boy, I really know this scripture now. Joshua 1, 8, 9, boy, I know it really good. Look at it carefully again. You're going to find out that those thousands of trees have thousands of seeds. But it all started with one seed. That's the way the Word of God is. It's been studied for hundreds and thousands of years, and they're still not finished discovering more out of it. You hear me? Okay, Exodus chapter 19 I'm just going to give you a quick summary uh, because we've been looking at it uh, over and over again. Exodus 19 is the picture, I said in last service, a picture of prayer. Prayer in the form of spiritual journeys. This past service, we covered several spiritual journeys. And I said that that's what prayer is. Prayer is a physical a, it, it's the physical body perhaps sitting still, but your spirit is very active. 
Prayer is a very active activity. If you look at people in the Bible, they, they, they were moving into different dimensions. They were seeing things. They were experiencing things. They were hearing things. They were very busy, very busy. So I said, when you look at somebody that's, prayer, that's praying, you may see him kneeling down. You say, well, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of activity there. He's murmuring a little bit. I see him just kneeling there. But really, in the realm of the Spirit, he is all over the place. All over the place. And if your prayer life is not like that, then you really don't have a prayer life. I don't know what you're doing, but you're not praying. Because prayer is advancing and moving into spiritual dimensions. Moving above the natural realm. That's why you're a spirit, so you can move in spiritual dimensions. If you're just going to be in the earthly dimension, you might as well have stayed a physical person. So Exodus shows us that Moses is going up and down this mountain. And what he's doing is when they arrived at, at the base of the mountain, the Lord called Moses to come on up. And the Lord began to speak to Moses, and then Moses would go down the mountain, and he would relate to the people what God has said. And then he would hear what the people would say, and he would go back up the mountain and relate to God what the people said. And then God would respond to the people. God, Moses would turn around and go back, and he was going back and forth. What I want you to notice uh, a pattern there of this mountaintop uh, dwelling, spending time on a mountaintop. Now, the mountain of Sinai represents a spiritual dimension. That's what the Bible says in the story, that the glory of the Lord, a cloud, would descend upon the mountain. The fire of God would, des would descend upon Mount Sinai. What was it doing? It was indicating that that particular region of the mountain was now a spiritual dimension. It was an earthly dimension. If you want to be in an earthly dimension, you have to stay at the bottom of the mountain where the rest of the people are at. But once you went up to the mount of uh, the top of Mount Sinai, now you were in the glory of the Lord. You were in the voice of God. You were receiving divine direction. And you yourself were being transformed. The Bible says that the glory of the Lord was on Moses' face where the people could not look at him. That is a picture of a spiritual person's prayer life. That's why sometimes it takes him long. What is he doing? He's climbing. He's climbing. He'll get into a dimension that, he, that no matter what's happening around him, it, it won't distract him. At the bottom, he'll get distracted. But once he goes into certain dimensions, you can't distract him anymore. He's gone. Have you ever heard... Somebody said about somebody else, man, that dude's gone. He's not all there. Well, in the realm of the Spirit, you're no longer there. You're somewhere else. We saw that in the book of Revelation with John, where John is on an island physically, but spiritually he's at the throne of God. He's looking at God. He's looking at the throne. He's seeing the angels. He's seeing the four creatures. He's seen the, the uh, 24 elders, the 24 thrones. He's looking at all of this. But if somebody would have gone by the mountain and says, hey, look, there's John over there. Doesn't look like he's doing much. Yes, your physical eyes are showing you where his physical body is at, but you're not seeing where he's at spiritually. He's at the throne room of God getting a tour of the throne of God. That is a prayer life. So Moses goes up this mountain. And I want you to notice something here because there's a couple of lessons I want us to, to take away from, from what we're seeing here. I want you to notice that after the first time that Moses go, goes up on the mountain, he no longer engages the people without first being in the mountain first. He no longer engages the people down in the valley from the valley. He's engaging the people from the top. 
He's engaging the situations down at the bottom, at the bottom from the top. So Moses is working from the top down. <laughs> he's working from the top down. He's not working from down and then engaging the people who are down there with him. He's not down at the base of the mountain and then engaging the situation. He's not engaging them in that manner. He's engaging them from the top down. What are we trying to do? Get you to engage January 2023 from the top down. If you engage from the bottom, then you're engaging it as a soul man, just a, 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 a one-man person, a, a mere human being. When you engage from the valley, when you engage from the bottom, people and situations, it's all you. And change will be a struggle. Or whatever you're trying to engage will be a struggle. Because that is a picture of man-made effort. You're engaging the world from the world. You're engaging the world from the same playing field. Are you hearing me? You're, you're engaging the world from the same playing field. That's why you're just as frustrated as they are. You're just as tired as they are. Just as confused as they are. Have you noticed how an argument ends up? Two people in the flesh. What's worse is both of them go to church. Y ahí está la legata. Back and forth. Que no, que tú, que tú me dijiste. Que no, que la tuya, que no. Neither one of them is engaging the situation from the top down. Moses engaged the people and some of the messes that were going down there, going on down in the valley from the top down. That means when Moses went up, he went up as a man. When he came down, he came in the likeness of God. He came in the likeness of God. What do I mean? In the likeness of God on the outside. Yes, we were created in the likeness of God on the inside, but nobody sees that. But you can get to a point that the likeness of God is now on the outside of you. That's why the anointing of God was on his face. Not on his spirit, on his face. Now even your flesh is holy. You engage the world from the top down. Not from the valley. Because you'll enter into arguments, frustrations, losing your patience, saying things you shouldn't say, getting in the flesh, a mess. You engage from the top down. Because what will happen it's just your very presence of coming down that mountain will begin to change things in the valley. I tell you, because it's your children that are in the valley. It's your job that is in the valley. It's your challenges that are in the valley. But when you come down from the mountain top, you are anointed. You're coming down from a, with a divine word that you received up there. You were touched by God up there at the mountaintop. A spiritual person wrapped in God is walking down that mountain. The wisdom of God is coming down that mountain. The understanding of God is coming down that mountain. Because Moses learned, if I'm going to engage what is going on over here, I need to engage it by way of the mountaintop. Now the people had to deal with a godlike man. 
That's why God told Moses, I'm going to make you like a God to Pharaoh. He's going to, you're not God, but he's going to make you think you are because you're going to be moving in my power. You're going to be speaking my word. My hand will be all in your life. And when you move, I move. What you say, I'll answer. But God had to train Moses that if you want me, you have to get to the mountaintop. I'm not going to meet you in the valley. Because there's a whole lot of flesh going on down there. God is holy because he sets himself apart. And he puts himself on a mountaintop. And his, in the, remember Isaiah chapter 60? And the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon you. How? Why? Because of where you've been. Because of where you've been. Let me finish this up. If you will, go with me over to Matthew chapter uh, Matthew chapter 14. We'll finish this up. You notice that especially when you come on Tuesdays, we try for the most part to put you in a, in a worship state. It's, we try to, as much as we can, do it very different than Sunday. The Bible says that Jesus would go off to the side and he would sit with his disciples and he would teach them. Even when he would preach to the masses, he would take his 12 off to the side and minister just to them. And sometimes he would take his three and minister just to them. That's what we're attempting to do on Sundays and in our leadership trainings and all these other things that, that we're doing is that we'll preach to everybody but then there's a time where we sit down with you and, and teach you. But you'll notice that after Jesus would finish teaching, he would leave them and guess where he would go? Let me show it to you. Look at Matthew chapter 14. Let me, let me get over there. Matthew chapter 14. I want you to take a look at where Jesus goes. In verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. He just finished teaching them, spending some time with them. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. He's sending the disciples away. Now watch what he does when he sends the disciples away. While well, he sent the multitude away, verse 23, and when he had sent the multitude away, he went up on the mountain. Now, he's spending time alone and he's climbing up a mountain. The same method that Moses was using to prepare himself for what is going on in the valley. Even Jesus is doing, following the same principle. He dealt with the disciples. He dealt with the crowds and everything that goes on down in the valley and, and trying to help sick people and all these things. But then he by himself, the disciples weren't invited. The people weren't invited. He goes off by himself up to the mountain. And what is he doing up on a mountaintop? He went by himself to do what? To pray. To get with God. Have an experience with God on a mountaintop. Because he knew what he was going to have to deal with in the valley. He knew what was coming up. So he made it a habit of constantly going off by himself to deserted places and to mountaintops. Why? Because when, you, because when you're going to engage the world or you're going to engage situations, you engage them from the top down. There are some victories in your life that may never happen because it all depends on where you're coming in from. There's some victories that are not going to take place if you're not coming 
if you're not coming into the situation from the top down. You were just next door. You were just right there in the valley. You were in the argument too. You're doing everything else that the, that, that the employees, that, that, that your fellow employees are doing. You're panicking just as they are. You're frustrated just as they are. What you should have done is you should have gone off by yourself. Get up into a spiritual dimension. Come back down when you know that you've been in His glory. And then engage the situation from the top down. Watch this. Because people that come from the top down, they alter what is happening down there. They alter what is happening down there. Amen. Moses came down with commandments from God and he altered the way humanity would live. Things in the valley get impacted and altered and changed by people that are working from the top down. So let's, let's see what Jesus does. Because this is describing a particular kind of walk. This is the kind of walk that I want us, the OA, to adopt. That you're not having a mediocre prayer life and, and you say a few words and a few things and then off to work you go. I, mean, I understand sometimes, you know, you, you, your day gets away from you, you wake up late, you got to do that. But let me tell you, you know when you got to deal with a situation the next day. I highly recommend that you don't engage it from the bottom to the bottom. That you first go up and engage it from the top down. Because there's some situations that really need God's anointing, don't they? There's some situations that are really, really important to you. Or they're really causing you a lot of trouble. Or they're really hurting your heart. Let me tell you. Don't go engage it. Don't say to yourself, well, I'm going to go talk to him. No, don't do it. Well, I'm going to go tell him exactly what I think. Well, then you're... You and God are nowhere near each other. Because that's not what Jesus taught you. He goes by the way of the mouth. Engaging from the top down. So let's see. And when, the, when he sent the multitude away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now evening had come and he was alone there. Notice. Notice what he's doing there. He's alone there. If Jesus needs to do it, what do you think we need to be doing? Verse 24. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, I want you to notice a picture here. Now, I want you to notice a little bit of symbolism. Many times in the scriptures, when, 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 when it talks about a body of water, like a sea or something like that, it's referring to masses of people. Massive, like a sea of people. Now, oh my God. watch this. The disciples are sitting in a boat right above the water. Now, the water represents the general public, the general world. The disciples are right above the water, indicating. That their walk with God is just a little bit better than the rest of the world. Your Christianity is just a little bit better. Not that much better than the rest of the world. You're, you're, you're just right on top of them. Your walk with God is just a little bit better than the rest of the world. Because you're still kind of fleshly. You know, you, 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 I mean, you're still speaking your mind when you shouldn't. Your prayer life is not all of that. You're sometimes in the scripture, sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're faithful at church, sometimes you're not. So your walk is just a little bit above the rest of the world. It's better, but not much better. So Jesus goes down to demonstrate a higher walk. So what does he do? He goes down the mountain and, watch, on purpose, he sent them away on the boat. 
knowing that he was going to go to them. So why did he send them away? He could have said, you know what, you guys wait there. I'm going to go with y'all across this body of water, but I'm going to go pray first. But I'm going to go with y'all, so y'all wait for me. No, he says, go ahead and take off. I'm going to go up this mountain. And when I come up down this mountain, I'm going to show you a higher walk. But I'm not going to finish there. So Jesus comes down the mountain. And the Bible says that he's walking on water. Now the disciples are not understanding what is going on because they say, oh my God, that's a ghost. He says, do not fear, it's just me. So he's walking on water. He's showing them a walk that's at a higher dimension. Now watch this. He's not showing off in a way where he's saying this, look at what I can do and you can't. He wasn't doing that. He wasn't showing off saying, well, you see me? I even do the moonwalk on this water. He wasn't doing that. Because watch what happens next. He's walking on water. He says, don't fear, it's me. Peter says, Lord, if that is you, bid me to come. Peter gets out of the boat, and guess what he does? He's walking on water. Oh, come on, Jackie. Come on now. God just elevated their walk. They were barely sitting on the water. Now they're walking on it. See, your walk can be right above the world. You're barely better than the world. You're barely more spiritual than the world. Barely. You're still kind of fleshly. You're still kind of, you know, have your old personality, old character. You still have some of the, your, your, your old ways. But then Jesus comes down this mountain and elevates Peter's walk. And everybody's checking out like, wow, we were impressed with Jesus walking on the water. But now Peter's walking on the water. They were never the same. Now they have to answer to their friends why they are not walking on water too. Oh, come on now. So what happens? People that come down the mountain, they alter things. Your children are not walking with God like you would like for them to be walking with them. It'll take you walking down the mountain to alter their walk, to elevate their walk. Because they're going to be seeing you walk in the supernatural and they're going to ask you if they can do the same. Because people that work from the top down, they change and they alter what's going on in the valley. And Peter was never the same. Peter now goes down to history books as a man who walked on water. How did it happen? Because someone else who was working from the top down called him out. Now Peter is walking a supernatural walk. This is what every preacher has to be doing. Every preacher has to approach the congregation for the mountain mountain this is why on, on, on Tuesdays you won't find me I mean you may see me walking in my neighborhood with my headphones on reciting scripture or praying or whatever the case may be but it's very rare that you're going to uh, unless there's something really going on that I need to attend to or whatever but for the most part Tuesday for a number of hours you're not going to find me Because when 7 o'clock comes on a Tuesday night or a Sunday morning, I'm approaching the congregation from the top down. Why? I don't know if a demon's going to show up. I don't know if somebody who's got the last few moments of their life to live is going to show up at church. I don't know if somebody's on the, on the last little bit of hope they're going to show up. I have to approach them from the top down. Not from the valley. You're not going to see me show up here, you know. I'm, I'm running a little late. I, I, I just left Whataburger. Not even as a Christian, when I used to sit in a, in a congregation like you do, I wouldn't even do that. I would get off of work, I'd get into prayer, then I'd go to church. Get off the work, get into prayer, and I'd go to church. 
and I had to drive an hour to church. I lived in Beeville, Texas, and I attended church in Corpus Christi. And I was three services per week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Because people that live their life from the top down, they bring God with them into the situation. And things begin to change. The problem is, is that for many Christians, life has gotten so cluttered and so busy that they've forgotten what the mountain looks like. Everybody's down in the valley getting on each other's nerves, trying to handle situations by man's methods. All kinds of messes going on. And the person has not even spent time with God. Every situation that you want the hand of God involved, whatever it is, you have to go to the mountaintop. You have to go there first. You're going to have to find the time. You're going to have to sacrifice a few things. Or else, you're left to the hand of man to handle that situation. Mountaintop people bring the supernatural to the valley. They bring divine word, divine wisdom, divine understanding. They bring the hand of God. When we engage in worship, it's the act of trying to elevate you up the mountain. From one song to the next song to the praying to the worship, we're trying to elevate you, elevate you, elevate you, elevate you, especially on Tuesday. You have to come with us. This is why sometimes it's very frustrating when we're trying to take the congregation up the mountain. And you see people that they're not even here. Their physical body's here, but they're counting the lights. Seeing what's over there. Looking at their watch. Here's a famous one. Leaning on their chair. Oh, my back hurts. I wonder if he's going to go long. I got to put the kids to bed. I got to work tomorrow. Yeah, I know. But wait till you get into a life and death situation. You won't care about that stuff no more. You won't care about that. Because the devil will rob you of your sleep. But you don't offer it as a sacrifice. He'll rob you of your sleep. You'll be up all night worrying could have been all night in worship on the mountain. Be careful that the best of you is what God gets, not the leftovers. Because the crisis always reveals if you're a mountaintop person or you've been down in the valley for too long. Down the valley people, they lose hope, they get frustrated, get angry, they give up, they make things worse. They're confused, they're tripping, stumbling, and not know what they're stumbling over. You cannot afford to skip the mountain. You cannot afford to go from one valley to another valley. you got to pay the price. If you want to hear from God, want his hand in greater dimension, you've got to make your way to the mountain. That's right. Your life is being lived 